Hey guys, welcome to Today's the Day with Zach Anderson. This episode is brought to you by Alchemy Sales Coaching. I hope you guys enjoy. Today's the day, baby. Today's the day. Today's the day. Today's the motherfucking day. Today is the day. Today's the day. Today is the day. Today's the day. What up, what up, what up, everybody? Welcome back to Today's the Day with Zach Anderson. Today I got a special guest, and I'm honestly... I'm kind of jazzed to get through it. This is more of a mystery episode for me, but before any anything further, um, welcome, Corey. Thank you so much for being here. Um, for everybody listening, we have Mr. Corey Sistrunk on, and I couldn't be more excited, man. I, I really appreciate you making the time and getting out here and getting vulnerable with me, dude. It's going to be a lot of fun. I'm stoked. Yeah. I mean, happy to be here. Hell yeah. Well, well um, this episode is going to be a little bit of a different layout. Um, and I think it's going to be a lot of fun. So I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm going to kind of hand the baton to you, but really there's a lot of accolades that we could go and kind of punch through and, and, and look at, but I, I want to hear the story, the origin story a lot, because frankly, you're kind of a mystery man, like, and, and hopefully clear that up. I think it'll be super valuable. It'll be a lot of fun, but Give me like a background on Corey. Give me the 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 story behind you growing up, where you're from, the the whole nine yards there, and let's work our way all the way up into today and what we're what we're working on today. Okay. Um, grew up in Southern California, and pretty much, you know, the the my dad was one of those guys that just forced me into everything. Um, like, and when I say forced, I mean forced. So. <laughs> you know, got me into skateboarding, surfing, every sport you could think of. He, you know, he was also a big deal because he, my mom's creative Mm -hmm. and he was like, you're going to be a broke art student, you know, Mm -hmm. you better figure something out. He's a partner of an insurance agency. So he, he was kind of pushing me in high school to be like, what are you going to do? And back then, you know, most of the young guys here have computer classes in school. There was nothing. So he just had me, uh, I started a clothing company. Um, I think before it was a thing. I think it happens more today. Mm -hmm. But I drew some stuff out on a piece of paper, had no idea how to, what to do. But we sold them the next day by lunch. We made 50 t-shirts, sold them. But then um, that's how I got into design. Is my dad met some some guy at at a restaurant. And... The guy was super tatted, and if you saw my dad, you wouldn't think these guys would chat. But he... Your dad was sharp, like, just straight as could be, straight as an arrow, suit and tie? Oh, yeah, every what? day, suit and tie. Wow, every day. that's good. And he saw the guy, and, you know, I think for him, I think with the... He had surfed a little bit as a kid and was, like, interested in it, so he was just, like, interested in this human mm-hmm. and wouldn't talk to him. And that guy was the lead designer for a skate brand back in the day called Ambiguous. Yeah. And this guy's never met this guy never met me. And he says, yeah, I'll take your son in. And so that guy is the one who, this guy's name was Brad or Brian. He, he, Brian's the one who showed me how to design. Like I, I'd go to his house, he was married and he would just show me like on his computer, like, like literally one thing at a time. And this is, you know, um, mid nineties. Just took you under his wing entirely. Entirely. Uh, well, real quick. So before we move on to that, yeah. cause that's a, a lot of your story is, is diving into design, not only what you have designed, yeah what you've accomplished with it, so on and so forth. But rewinding a little bit, you said your dad like forced you into a lot of things like skating, surfing, stuff like that. Why do you think? Well, was he just like living through you or was he uh, like what? I, You know, I think there's times where I felt that way with football. I thought I was going to break his heart. And I, I, I really did. Um, I, I uh, wouldn't football was the one he didn't force when I was younger. But as I got into like junior high and high school, he was like, you got to play football. I was like, I have no desire to yeah. play football. And and then I did finally freshman year, he talked me in the school started. But I you know, I and I went in and I and I broke my leg skateboarding and the coach asked me to pick and I was like, This is easy. <laughs> I'm out. So but I think, yeah, I think there was some of that for him that was like, you gotta try everything. Mm-hmm. He wasn't it didn't feel as much like you pick a lane, but it was like you gotta try it. And I think the skateboarding and surfing specifically was probably a way for him to do more of what he didn't get exposed to as a kid. Mm. Um, but I think in a lot of ways, he's still just, so just exposure to different worlds yeah. that he didn't really get experience. And he loves hard work, like psychotic hard work. Yeah. So I think for him too, it was like sports were, and I'm the oldest. So I think for him, it was like, I got to get this kid 
involved in stuff. Yeah. Because he thought, hey, it's going to help him be social, but also just going to learn how to work. Yeah. And so, yeah. I just think, keeping you occupied, kind of. Yeah. Cool. But he's aggressive. There you he go. played rugby in college. And I mean, I paddled out surfing with tears. Uh, I mean, I still probably tear up more than most, but it was like, you're doing, I don't care. You get in the water, you know, and you're like, I don't want to, you know? So. Yeah. That's awesome. That's so cool. So then fast forwarding, it, it was your senior year of high school or whenabouts was it where, where you said his name was Brian. Yeah. Took you under his wing and was going to go and he was teaching you. And why also why? I, like what was the, what was the, I think my dad was like, Hey, we sold the 50 shirts. Yeah. And my dad's like, do it again. I was like, you have to basically do it again because he did it all. At that point, I drew it. But he I think he was just trying to facilitate. Mm. And so we tried it again and again. And, and so by the time I, that he met that guy, we'd been probably doing it for a year. And I'm 16, probably 16. And um, why I think my dad was just like, well, we don't know what we're doing. This guy's working for a company who's doing what I think we're trying to do. Yeah. And, uh, but I don't, I don't even know if there was like some backdoor deal that my dad was paying him because <laughs> he was so cool. I, lo- looking back, it didn't feel as weird as it feels to talk about it. Yeah. Um, Cause I would hang out there for hours and like we had, they met at a, like a restaurant, like they did not have any background. Yeah. And, and he was just taking his time to teach you. Yeah. And then as he was teaching you, was that shaping like, Oh, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to go into. Like, this is like, a career, a potential career path or what was for you going, why would you take up your time then? I guess, cause maybe we don't know why he would take up his time yeah. and, and teach you. Why did you care enough to go over there and do that? Yeah. I mean, I think I didn't want to work another job. Mm. So I think if I were to back up, I think that the real, like the story that I would say like origin origin for me is actually seventh grade. Um, I think at that point, the only thing I really cared about was skateboarding mm-hmm. and Chad Muska, which, you know, is, is, a, is a gangster now, but, like, he was the biggest, you know, him and Eric Costin were, like, the biggest two guys at, all, at the time. And his shoe came out, and I remember, like, Dad didn't buy shoes. I had to buy skate shoes. So I save up, and I come to school the first day they released. We all, I went and bought them, and, like, 10 other kids had saved their own money and bought them. And I remember being, like, this is crazy, like, we literally like organized ourselves around this drop yeah. before drops were a thing. Yeah. And I didn't know what it was, but there was something about what that, how that connected us that I, I feel like I was into. I didn't know what, how you would do that, what it meant. Um, but the clothing thing was more like my, it's Taco Bell or this. Mm-hmm. And so <laughs> the little bit was surviving. Yeah. I don't know that I knew it could be a career. That's awesome. So then what did that lead into? You go and you're, you're learning all of it. Are you utilizing it? Are you just making more shirt drops? What are you doing going forward from there? Yeah. You, so we start to learn all this stuff. I mean, he would start contrib. Brian would start contributing design to, to the, so to the lineup and it would, it started with a t-shirt, then a t-shirt, long sleeve jacket, hat. Um, and then we started selling into some local skate shops. So it was at that point that I feel like, yeah, it, it just was growing. Mm-hmm. And most of that was just relationships through skateboarding itself that were opening the door, I guess, if you will. Yeah. But um, you weren't thinking that long term. You were just. That's how I ended up in the back of my truck. Like, I really just was like skate, surf, friends. Yeah. Wakeboarding, do it again. Like, I played soccer. It was organized, but it was still never. I never felt like soccer was a career. Yeah. And I, I mean, I still love soccer, but it was in a way I just felt like I just don't want to work and do anything else. You were just rocking day by day. And it felt like I get to do this. Like, yeah, we'd go to trade shows. I'm like, I'm taking my friends. I'd pay. My garage was like the fulfillment center. Like we would fold the shirts for all the stores. I'd pay them. Like, I can't remember, it was like 10 cents a shirt, but it was like, I can hang out with my friends and we're getting enough money. And that that's all that it felt like. It was just enough money to do the things you loved and to be around the people I wanted to. Yeah. So I really had no future. In fact, every time my dad would try to talk about the future, I was like, you're tripping. Like, let's, this is Like, relax, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) What did that lead into as that goes on? How long did that go on before either you weren't making enough money or maybe you naturally fell into the next level or 
But yeah, what what came next? So I move out. So senior year, I move out, uh, and I'm living out of the back of my truck, like I said, mm-hmm. at the beach. And and at that time, my dad and I are still really tight. I'm pretty estranged from the family, and that the clothing cl- brand was still going. And um, through a chain of events, I decided to to drop everything and, and serve a mission for my church. And where did that come from? I had. Um, Two buddies coming to pick me up, drunk driving incident, they die. Best friend gets his, well, not a best friend, good friend gets his girlfriend pregnant, drops out of college to, to start providing. Another friend on track to go play Premier League soccer gets in drug trouble and gets dropped. Um, I just think I had like a, a series of events and then my best friend's dad died um, and we're 18. So there was like this, like a burst of like really like deep questioning kind of, you know, situations Mm -hmm. at which I don't think any of them really were forcing me to think about it. But as I look back, you know, I started going to pretty much any religion outside of the faith I grew up in. And that's kind of the irony of it is that I was in a a dean or professor of religion at USC. I went to one of this like Christian church thing. And he was just destroying everything that I'd ever heard about anything. And somehow in that moment, I was like, um, I got to change my life. So I ended up serving a mission in Georgia. But Where in Georgia? This Macon doesn't. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. Warner Robins Macon area. Yeah, Warner Robins for six months. Absolutely. I love it. I love it. Yeah. That's awesome. So, <laughs> but that's the detour because the guy left running the company while I was gone. Got in, he went to jail for drugs. And so I got home. And we sold it to some some lady. But it kind of like, you know, my dad was trying to, my dad's a, running his own company. So he was trying to hire people to take it over after that guy went to jail. And it just never took off. So rewind a little bit. <laughs> yeah. So you served two years. You left two years, right? Yeah. Series of crazy events. Found yourself questioning things. You ended up on a two-year mission for your church in, in Georgia. So just across the country. Yeah. While you were gone, company fell apart. Your buddy who was supposed to be running it got into trouble, wasn't able to maintain it. Your dad obviously tried to help as much as he could, but he was running his own business. So then you fly back to California, and then you say you just you moved to Utah chasing a girl. What? How, how does that happen? You got to California. You knew her. She moved to Utah. You followed her or what? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, I got home, and, and I think— I was actually, I went, I went out surfing with a few, a few of my friends and I just realized like, I, I, I feel so lost. Like it was weird to be back at home and feel lost, but felt lost. And then my cousin it, it introduced me to a girl and, and we, she was moving to Utah and my mom's like, actually, I registered you for some UVSC school while you were gone. I didn't tell you. I was like, well, I'm going to go to art school. And so I don't know, but I'll, I'll just go for a semester. So it originally was like, I'll just go up for a semester. Yeah. I'm already don't know where, which way I want to go right now. So, and that, that there's no up. wrong option at yeah. that point. It lasted three weeks and, but it got you to Utah. <laughs> but I was here, but it yeah. got you to Utah. It got me here. So then you got, you moved, you moved out of state to follow some girl. It lasted three weeks. Didn't work out. Then yeah. what? Met my wife, um, at school. Who's the coolest by the way? She's insane. Yeah. So I met her and, and, Still didn't want to be here, so I moved back to California. She saw that as a sign I didn't care about her. We broke up. Rightfully so. Yeah. Right. I think at the end of this, you'll realize I make a lot of mistakes. Um, Everybody does. So, yeah, I, I, I wanted to go to art school, and I, and I felt like I couldn't get access to what I wanted to here. And, but I was already, like, a, a mess. Like, I didn't think she was going to, I didn't think I was ending it. I was like, just come with me. She's like, you can't even say I love you. I was like, I love you. That didn't work. Um, Spur of the moment. Yeah, I tried. <laughs> so we did long distance for a while. And then um, over time, realized I was like, she was it. I kind of knew the first night, which was stressful. Because most of my friends, I mean, a lot of them are still not married. Mm-hmm. So at the time, it was like the idea of thinking someone could be the one and I'd only had six month or less relationships was- felt like there's no way. Yeah. You know, yeah. so I feel like I was kind of sabotaging a lot of the early mar- or dating, but she's why I came back. And then, yeah, kind of went from there, got married eventually. There you go. I like it. So 
relationship complications, move back to California, <laughs> move back. She got you back here. Yeah. Um, and then, and then when you moved back here, what were you doing with your day to day? And then how did you get from moving back at age, you were probably 21 or 22 at that point, right? Yeah. 22, 22 at that point, then kind of your journey here gets super interesting. And I think for a lot of people that listen to this regularly is going to resonate. And a lot of them are going to be like, holy shit, no way he had a piece in that. He had a part in that. I think that's, that's, I'm excited to talk about that stuff because yeah. it's been very, I've, I've talked about it very little with you. So yeah, I'm excited yeah. about it. So UBSC, now UVU. But they, they had a graphic design program, so that was initially day-to-day. It was like student. Yep. Going to school. Uh, briefly before moving back to Utah, the the, the, the door-to-door kids were down in, in uh, my home like area. And so I did a stint with a pest control company. Mm-hmm. So that was my first exposure. And then went to school, right? But then um, we get married in 2007, and I went and sold for Apex. And sold for a summer, um, you know, decided that uh, my experience with um, that company at the time wasn't great. So I was going to go back and I actually recruited like an office for the pest control company. Mm -hmm. And then like three weeks before it, um, Bodie Gardner was my regional at Apex. He he's the one who called me and he said, Hey, we're going to open their, they're opening a design thing at our company. Do you want a job? I don't know. I'll, I'll introduce you. And I was like, I guess. So I'm just, cause I'm still in school. Yeah. And I went and interviewed and, uh, I, again, probably no dumb decision, but I, I literally dropped, I told all the guys that I recruited that they needed to go and do it, but I'm going to go work at a competitor's design like team. And there's no team. There's yeah. one person, but I, I felt like at that time, Apex had a trajectory and I just felt like they didn't know what they didn't know. So I'm like, I'm going to go in here and be able to just like learn for sure in a way that just doesn't happen. Yeah. So learn by actually going and doing it. Like literally. Yeah. yeah. That's so awesome. I'm, I'm still in school. I get the job at Apex and, and I'm a junior graphic designer and they, you know, it's so cool when I look back, but the, they were just super, like all the people around me were supportive and I just kept getting promoted. And then I, be, so I went from like junior designer to senior designer and, and then became the art director there and was just running all, all of the creative, you know, um, I credit to Bodie Gardner and, and Kevin Swiss were the two guys that like just were mentoring and clearing the way for me. Yeah. And then, you know, you've obviously Todd, you know, well, for some reason, Todd was also giving trust. When you look back, I was 23, 24. Yeah. And it was like, you got this. Like, it really felt like full support. What do you need? Let's go. Yeah. And so in a way, but I was, it was exposure. Mm -hmm. And then one day Todd comes in and goes, we need to change this thing. We're gonna do smart home. I'm like, well, the URL is apex alarm. That's a problem. So that's where the rebrand took place to Vivint. Mm -hmm. So um, and this is what year? 20? It's 2011, I think. 2010. Got it. got it, got it, got it. Is when it switched. Yep. So, yeah, I was there. And about a year after the rebrand, um, I had an opportunity to go to San Francisco. And, you know, obviously had to draw to, to get back out of Utah. So um, I decided to to take the job. It was a studio there that was 30 years old. And they wanted, they were just doing architecture. I have no background in architecture. And they wanted to like, um, well, I should back up. I met this guy when he designed the first building of the a- the Vivint campus. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. So the architect that was hired, my friend was working at Vans, one of my buddies from growing up. So when we when that building came up, they showed me the plans. And I was like, this looks terrible. Like it just looked like a corporate office. So we flew and uh, we went and looked at like Google, Vans, um, a couple others. I can't remember, just like a day trip. Hired this guy that we worked on that project. So that was my first exposure to like buildings. And I was intrigued that when you think about brand, the building is like the thing that like shapes it, like it's built in that house. Yeah, literally. So I'm like, it was such an interesting project to like shape the environment for the first time. And he was super intrigued by like having me as a, as a counterpart. Cause he's like, usually when I design buildings, like we're just drawing designs and, and he felt like I 
um, you know, cared a lot more than he thought I would, I guess. Yeah, yeah. So he made an offer. It, and the offer was like growth. That's the, the main thing I cared about. But there was no like title. They never hired anyone like me. So I get in there. They they taped the glass office closed so no one could see what I was working on because I was rebranding the company away from architecture. And um, anyhow, first clients were Adobe and uh, there in, in the North Face, Google, Apple, GE, uh, a ton of tech, Dropbox. And I just literally, again, someone older than me just said, like, you got this. And he just left me there to do it. That's crazy. So you got taken back out to California after working for Apex, rebranding Apex to Vivint. Yep. Shipped out to California. Um, and then they hired, you said there's no title, but what you were designing, what? Like you were just, they were just like, hey, we need a full rebrand. We need this design. And they were just give, offloading work to you from the biggest names in, honestly, the U.S. or the world between Apple, Google, the North Face. Yeah. And I'm not listing them all. Yeah, it was a lot. When With the way I see it, and, and this is, I think, why he hired me. Um, I've always felt like brands become the means that connect human beings. So if you want to, like, whether we get there or not now, for me, there was something in that seventh grade experience that that is really what I cared about. Design becomes one of the tools used. Yeah. But the ability to connect human beings is what I think brands provide. And I think that most of our genuine, like, fulfillment in life is about how we're connected to other people. So when you, when I look at it, when even when he hired me, the idea was, could we take an architecture, you know, background yep. in a brand kid? And could we create a model that actually looked at brands through this lens of connecting human beings? And I think that's the deepest part of where we connected is that that guy's name was David. That I was just like, I, there's something about this that feels like it shouldn't be siloed because that's what most businesses are doing. They don't understand brand. They see brand as the logo and the colors. But brand is all of it. It's yep. the sum of all of it. 100%. So th- that was the idea. Is could we turn the ship? And, and that was the hypothesis. Yep. So, um, and he, he was, I think, you know, he was deeper in his careers than his 50s when we, when we connected. Mm-hmm. So I think for him, it was like, this is, he's already experienced all the success. Like, let's try this. And, but his dad passed away three weeks in and he ended up taking and opening up the LA office. It, we had an LA office, but he started growing that studio out. Um, and, and he just trusted me. He literally sent me to like the second, he went to the first North Face meeting and the first Adobe meeting. We, we did those like deeply together. But within weeks, it was like, you got this meeting. And talk about feeling like, pretty vulnerable. I was like, I, I've done this for an alarm company in Utah that you've never heard of, but it worked, you know? And, yeah. and what I found was the North face and others were like, they, they believe the same things. And yeah. There's so many multi meaning words that get used in, especially in the creative space, yeah. because a lot of people either a don't care to understand it or B understand it differently because of their experience, a brand or a culture, right? Basically means that when somebody is accepted as a part of it they take on a certain identity being a part of it if that makes sense totally so like exactly like you're saying like the fact that an alarm company or any company can go and and establish a brand or a culture where people once they're a part of it they take on the identity of it and they like like that that's the true value in going and creating a brand And, and that's the value i think in design and creative in general and it gets overlooked by people who don't understand it and it's yeah. cool that, I mean, you've gotten to go and do that for their companies. How do other companies go and implement that? When you're talking the North Face and stuff like that, like what what are you going and, and when you're in these meetings, you're selling an idea of some sort. You're yeah. convincing them to go and, and I don't know exactly what it is that that means, but like what does that mean? And then how are they seeing it or not seeing it? Because I'm assuming some of the deals didn't go through or whatever it may be, right? Like what's your experience there? I hope you guys are enjoying this episode so far. It was brought to you by Alchemy Sales Coaching. I started doing one-on-one coaching with Doug back in 2019. And since then, I have gone and not only blown up my career and my earnings, um, but it's really helped me through just the ups and downs of life. Now, the reason I feel so strongly about Alchemy is because it's a group of individuals not only focusing on furthering their sales career, but they're diving deep into inner work. Um, and becoming the best version of yourself so you can show up and be the best version of yourself. 
Um, not only that, if you have any interest in doing any one-on-one -on -one coaching with me, I exclusively do all of my one-on-one -on -one coaching through Alchemy. Um, so for full access to me, go and check out Alchemy. I think you'll absolutely love it. It's alchemysalescoaching.com. We will also go and post um, the links in our bio and on stories, et cetera. So go check it out. Hey guys, hope you're enjoying the show. My name is Quince. And I'm Coy. We are the owners of King Cool Plunge, a Utah-based cold plunge company. If you want to improve your physical, mental, emotional well-being, this is for you. Check us out at kingcoolplunge.com. That's K-I-N-G-K-O-O-L-P-L-U-N-G-E.com. For a special offer at checkout, use code TTD. Now back to the show. What most big brands have, they, as you grow, as any culture grows, you start to divide and conquer. But at the end of the day, the very first thing that happened, which is still, is, and this is where I struggle when I, when people start talking about like, it's just business, it's people, full stop, it's people mm -hmm. that monetize, but it's people. So if people, like every decision we make as human beings is to say something about ourselves. So when you talk about the culture shaping you, well, the decision up front though, is to be a part of it. Yep. So one of the things that I think most brands are struggling with is they don't even know what they stand for. They don't know why they exist because a lot of times the business problem surfaced this, the founder CEO says, I got something here. Virgin Airlines. Flight gets canceled. He's rich enough to say, I'm going to go get a flight. And you know what? I'm going to go fix flight. And then you get Virgin, you know, Airways. But like a lot of it, it was that. It's like there's a problem and a solution. But now the culture to stand that up and defend that is why like people talk about a Zappos selling shoes online as this wild cultural experience because their whole thing was about delivering happiness, not about shoes. But I would say that that's an anomaly when it talk when you talk about brand and culture. Yeah, is that too often the finance guys make decisions without real DNA of what the brand stands for, why it exists, what does it matter in the lives of themselves and especially the, their their audience. Yeah, but so that that's probably what do good brands do? They they understand that there isn't not a single activity that isn't like by necessity like intentional. That isn't through this lens of this is why I exist. And I would say no different than the human. You, I, I would assume that your best people in your life, the people you rely on are the most consistent. Doesn't mean they look like you. It doesn't mean they sound like you, but they are, their values line up and you know what you're getting. Yeah. And when they live in that authentic state, you're like, I'm in, right? Yeah. If someone's wishy-washy and every time you're around them, they change their behavior. You're like, I don't trust this person. Yeah. So well, a lot of brands are doing that because as they grow, they hire new executives, new executive comes in. I'm taking finance a different direction and I'm going to charge more. Next guy comes in and says, I don't like the design of this. I'm going to change the design. So what, what I've always tried to do, which is why I think the work is so different. The way the projects come are usually through like, can you design a new shoe? Yeah. Can you give us a logo? The work that I think I'm actually doing is trying to help them see what they actually stand for. Yep. To stand up something definitive that they then push everything through. And then hopefully a shoe comes out. Brand to me, and I, and I, and I try to do this with each human being, is like, why do you exist? And I think that that's a company, I, I can't remember who said it, but the, the quote that I, I love is just the two most important days of your life is the day you were born and the day you know why you were born. A brand is no different. The day it was born is important. But when we get to the place where, that's probably my favorite part, is when I can see a founder go, I actually love what I do. Mm. I've been making money. I didn't realize why I really do what I do. But the decisions they make are saying something. Yeah. And they're using it to say something. But a lot of times, they just don't know what it's supposed to say and why. It just happened naturally. You fell into it. Mm -hmm. Why do you do what you do? Ah, well, my buddy was going out for the summer, so I went. Why are you still doing it? I make a lot of money. No, but really, why are you still doing it? Yeah. There's something there. And yeah. it's just often not 100% no spent the time to figure it out. So you you mentioned early on in that as, as and I love that, by the way, I, I just want to pick it apart a little bit. As, as companies go and they scale, are you saying that most companies are created out of a solution mindset? And then as time goes on, hopefully they identify like their North Star and their purpose. Or do you feel like they're born with a solution mindset, they have this North Star and this purpose, and then they lose it along the way? Or maybe both? It's both. 
when your North Star personally, like individually aligns with a corporation or a company and they've clearly identified and expressed their North Star is when you get a synergetic experience and when you have people go and just absolutely dominate where they are, where some people would fail. Right? 100%. And, and, I, yeah. and I think that should be the, that's the goal. That is the goal. But I would say that... And you probably already said that. I was no, just relaying it. In no, you just gave me the grade, chills. Fifth grade term, so I can no. understand it. <laughs> you probably already said it. But. I'm not the smartest kid in the room, I'll tell you that. But the, when I think about who I'm trying to become, the best case scenario is I've taken the actual time to not just do what other people have asked me to do, not just do what I have to do, but I've actually spent enough time to know what I stand for and I do everything to be aware of and in control of my actions accordingly. There's, there's some people who I think have spent enough time to know who they are. And I think that's, a, that's an evolutionary process. You've got to like try things. But when I look at my daughter, I'm like, what do you value? So I have this little values cards game that, that I didn't pull. I did it at a, an executive retreat one time when I was like in my mid-20s. And I had never actually sat down and wrote my values out. Mm. I would say I was pretty principled at that point. I went from pretty lost to feeling pretty like strong in what I was, what I was about. I never, I had no idea. And I remember like the word that I was left with, they, there's like a hundred values. You cut it down, you cut it down, you cut it down. And they get you to 10. And by 10, you're like, I want all of it. And they're like, keep going, cut it to five. Now rank it one to five. And for me, I was like, I had no idea. But at the end of the day, and I, and this is where culture I think matters is that, I can show up as a friend. I can show up as a father. I can show up in business if I know what I'm about Mm -hmm. and I know what matters to me. And so to the point you made, once you know, that's where I would say the cultures can shape us for sure. But I think the strongest cultures are those who identified who they are and they come in contributing. They come in saying, this is what I believe. So now I don't, I'm not worried about what comes back. Mm. The cause is enough. So when companies grow, it starts to get lost because in a lot of times to manage culture, we start putting in different sets of rules. You start getting into places where, well, because we got sued once, we will no longer do this, right? And because we want to go public, we will now cut out these benefits because we want to make EBITDA look a certain way. And those guardrails, and don't lose your train of thought, those guardrails... They they deteriorate that North Star that everyone's attracted to in the first place. They like can. They, they violate it occasionally, or they yeah. can. They can. Yeah. They don't always, but they violate your core values or whatever. Totally. In this example, what you would call it exactly? Yeah. yeah. How do you create North Star but actually live it in repetitive and scalable format? The the amount of just thinking that that takes to yeah. set up the cultural benefit, but I just think in general. What gets lost is often the people who are captaining a culture have never thought about it themselves. Mm. And that's what I find is when I usually go, hey, why'd you start the company? They'll have a good reason, solution-oriented. Why do you still do it? Well, I have a lot of people that report to me. There's a lot of people that depend on me. So what? You could walk away from, I mean, people walk away from responsibility every day. So, and, and you find like that, that's the, that's the thing that I love the most is like it's spending time because you, as you peel back the layers, everyone has a reason they did it. Mm-hmm. They just don't always know why, right? Yep. Like that, that seventh grader really didn't know that the shoe mattered to him. I didn't, I didn't know it the way I look back at the experience and go, that was in a moment and that was a moment. And so there's a little bit of that too with the, with the North Star of like standing up the idea for culture, then going out and testing it and being willing to like keep going back and saying, is this it? Are we doing it? Mm -hmm. Like my parents never came in and said, are we doing it right? Yeah. You know, like where are you feeling like maybe we're stiff arming you or where do you, like, it's just like, you're just going and life's rolling. And I think that's the hope for me is that I don't, I don't end my life and just say, well, it just happened. Yeah. But I created the space to say, what do I care about? And did I do it? Yeah. Like truly, truly living life by design. Like Jeff Mendez's favorite. Favorite, or one of my favorite one-liners of Jeff Mendez is just live life by design, not not by default. Um, There's a Jay-Z line for that. Is it? What's Jay-Z's line? I can't remember. It's but I it's a little stuck. bit cooler. Well, it was Jay-Z. Yeah. But Jeff Mendez, Sorry, Jeff. to me, is up there. <laughs> With Jay-Z. Yeah. That's that's props. I love that. There yeah. you go, Poppy. Yeah. Someone whose nickname is Poppy. Just know, the first time I met that guy, I was like, 
Everyone's calling this guy Poppy. Yeah, grown men. There's 50 grown men in a room calling him Poppy. And I call him Poppy now as well. I didn't even realize that. But well, yeah. no, I mean. That's facts. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I love the guy. I love it. But yeah, that he gets culture. So when, I mean, I'm not trying to take away from the Jay-Z quote, but like that's for sure a guy that I just don't think anyone would ever know if they really understood like how much he's pulling in with the way he consumes life and just is observing to influence the amount of people to that point. Because you know someone who's been around him by the way they speak. Yeah. I can tell someone like, do you work with Jeff Mendes? Yeah. They're like, yeah. I'm like, he, your speech pattern's the same. Yeah, yeah. Right? Jeff Mendes, I actually agree with you that he is like, when it comes to creating a, a true culture or a brand or an identity more so, he uses systems to do that. And usually it feels like systems hurt that. Because sure. most people, when you're when you're talking about someone or or, or someone has an identity of themselves, most guardrails are going to go and kind of put them in a box, and and you don't want to be in a box. Jeff Mendez has a superpower of creating systems that encourage a certain identity, which is really really cool. And I don't understand how to do that or what role does that in a business or how that works or anything like that. And maybe I'm curious to your observations on that because. Most people wouldn't say Jeff is like a the culture guy or like the brand guy. They would say he's the systems guy. And he is, but his systems cater directly towards a culture that he views and identifies long before he creates the systems. Otherwise, they would clash. Yeah. When, the, the way I see it is that this, this role really starts with the CEO. I don't think most personalities in the CEO role see this as their role, right? The mm -hmm. HR person does that. The marketing person does that. Mm -hmm. But- the great CEOs, I think, see culture as their like number one. And so the so the I guess the method that I'm always and this is why I bring up those values cards. And it's like I'm unapologetic. Like it's not my idea. I found it. I saw it. It was incredible. And I use it all I, if you came in my office right now, there's a stack sitting right there. Uh we did a retreat for Sandlot. I bring them. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, cause part of it is like I, I want to understand you. So if I have you do the experiment and I understand now we know what it is between each other, mm -hmm. we can behave differently. But if I don't know what you stand for, what you believe and what you value, like how, how could I model it? So in, importantly, yeah, yeah. that's the way the method for us is like, what are the values and why do you exist? And it's not just, you know, we've had people say like, I'm, I'm creating millionaires. That's, and I'm like, amazing. Let's keep going. Because it's not why if your customer heard that your business was to create millionaires, you're dead. Game over. Like, no one's buying your product. <laughs> yeah. So, so typically it's like, let's get back to what it is at the core, which is the mission stuff. Like, what what is the cause so great that you would die for it? And mm -hmm. if you never reach the end, you wouldn't care. Like that that feels like it has to be that big. And so that's the struggle I have when when you can create finite end spots. Like we're gonna go public. There's plenty. Of, I felt this a lot in San Francisco. There was a model that said in the VC space, build it, sell it, build it, sell it, build it, sell it. Aptive is another example. They had built, sold, built, sold, built, sold. Aptive was the first time they, the founders were like, we don't want to sell this one. This one's for us. The culture then became a lot different. If you look at Aptive yeah. to historic, there was a different kind of point of view. Yep. So um, you've had John Taylor on here, like the grit guys. Like the, We went with them and it was like... Uh, we think we have a good culture, but we're not really sure if we can articulate it. So step one is what is your value? Like long-term vision. Yeah. What are the values that stand up? And then the systems have to be filtered. So the way I typically will do this, we'll, we'll like really go through like take the values. Now what are your pillars that if you took one out, it's no longer you. Mm. This is where I think poppy stuff gets really powerful. If you know that, if, let's say there's four values. And those are like, you, they, and, and you just have like, these are the pillars that stand for those. Now you stand up systems to ensure that's the outcome. Those stay. Now you have Navy SEALs, right? Mm -hmm. Someone signing up for a Navy SEAL knows going in what that means. Yeah, the, this is what the identity holds. And yeah. then everything along the whole process ensures that they can uphold those core values. And literally we, we do this. It's, it's annoying for some, especially executives who are busy. If you were to start taking different audiences of your company, of that culture, and you, and you know what you stand for, you know what the systems are, and you actually go, they have an invitation to show up, right? They have a, a you know, pre-arrival experience. They, have a, they arrive to the 
whatever, to the job. And then you have every activity that happens. If you've done it right, you know what their arrival emotional state was. And you know what your intended emotional outcome is. And you know what you want their intended behavior to be. Mm -hmm. You start getting there, predictable, right? Scale. And that's where I think, yeah, I never thought we'd be here talking about Poppy the whole time. But that's what (laughs) I think is so incredible is you could tell he had thought through just his meeting. Just the Mm -hmm. correlation was like, this guy has a role. This person has a role. She has a role. This is this. We say this. We do this. We say it like this. That's someone who's really thought through and created a system. But the culture was not, it, it, it just didn't happen. Agreed. Yeah, yeah, agreed. I, I love that. And yeah, you're right, Poppy. Shout out Poppy, honestly. Yeah. Um, his episode is gas. I love that, dude. Um, so in, in talking about all this, I think I have a million questions, but one that I'm like very curious about, and I wonder if other people would be as well, is some of these big companies you've worked with, like we keep mentioning North Star, there's a lot of different ways, mission statements, a lot of different ways to go and identify these things. But just like the guiding principles of these massive, massive businesses, what would you say, I don't know if you can share them really, but are like the the strongest that you've seen and with which companies? And then what were you like, dude, what the hell you guys are like lost right now? So at at scale, um, Nike's the one that has been the most impressive. Mm. Um, you know, a lot of people now have read Shoe Dog, so you, they, they get more of the DNA. But, you know, first time I visit Nike's campus, we go to get a tour. And the person we met with said, uh, let me make sure I got you on the schedule. I'm like, you can't, can't you just give us the tour? And they're like, no. I'm like, what do you mean? They're like, you have to test out to, to give a tour at Nike. Like, you have to know what needs to be said in order to tell others about Nike. And in the culture, like, you know, again, massive, massive company, all the reasons to fall apart. And I'm not saying that, you know, every culture has its, its stuff. And there are people maybe who are unhappy there. But, you know, to be in a meeting, so I, I've only had a handful of meetings with the company. But first meeting I have, the person's still sweating post-shower from a workout midday. Because they're all about sport. The athlete is literally what they stand for. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's why they'll make disproportionate investments that others will not. I think this is the Disney example. Like, you know, our friend, you know, Casey might have warped my Disneyland experience forever. Because he says, come, come over to Disneyland. We were out at a cheer competition and we got a tour guide. (laughs) When you realize that, and this is in the Disney Institute's like little handbook. Like their whole thing is that we see values where others do not and we invest where others will not. Mm-hmm. And so, and I think Nike ex- expresses that. It was, every building is not just like, oh, that's Tiger's building with a name on it. It mm-hmm. was like, here's the lore that we built in so that you understand the intentional nature of this. And yeah. the kitchen where they do all their innovation is by assignment only. Very few employees at Nike have open access to the kitchen. So they're like, they're pushing the envelope all the time. And and I think that's why they stay, that's how they've stayed relevant. Mm. Um, so that's at a scaled version, I think they've, they've always stood out to me. And, you know, Apple has a, a million examples, but the irony about uh, some of those companies is like, that doesn't always mean some co- companies have a ton of success delivering on their value and their mission statement to the external world at the expense of the humans who deliver that. And I think, again, that's where this gets really hard and why I would say, like, I don't think I'll ever arrive at a place where I'm like, we did it. You yeah, know, yeah. Or that a company is like, even the only, co- even in my position where I've ever felt like I'm, I'm good enough as a husband, I'm good enough as a friend. Like, it just, but hopefully we discover more mm-hmm. and... Um, evolve to a place where more and more companies behave. And this, I think, you know, here's another thing that really sucks about you get a founder, they start a company, it takes off. If you're going really fast, you will need outside capital. The second you drop outside capital, you've created new rules. You have new bosses. They want, and, you know, local companies, we could go through lists. You sell 
it's a great liquidity day, right? People make some money, take some chips off the table. But now you go public, a whole other audience who has no idea what you're doing, why you do it. Frankly, don't care. Don't care. They see one article or hear one thing that could be bad and they start selling. Yep. So that is what's really hard for me is like some of the best brands or cultures that I've seen are often the ones that are really powerful until they're not. Mm. Supreme. Like one of the, I mean, preeminent street, street skate cultures that explodes, Mm -hmm. gets bought. And just the idea of being bought is probably for a lot of their audience. Like, thank you. Yeah, I'm out. I appreciate the run. No disrespect. I'm going to take my, you know, take my talents elsewhere. Like, I think that that's the difficulty. And it's like, but it was, was the person who made that decision wrong? Like, I don't know. Stussy Mm. sold. And then the the founder came back in and like took it back. There's like this period. If you watch Stussy's history is like super relevant, completely irrelevant, becomes relevant again. And you found it's it's the the DNA was gone. Like the actual life force had stepped away. Yeah. So I think that, you know, that's what's always really hard for me is like, I often think, and there's plenty of arguments that make this, that the strongest brands are often the most valuable companies. The culture is never considered in that. So I think that the difficulty is like the rewards of business and the rewards of culture, I don't know, line up. And and I'll tell you, I spend every day trying to figure that out because when culture is winning, I think business outcomes are there. Yeah. But I think at some point when the, you know, the business decisions are made, the culture could and it's so hard to judge like what's like you said like is it right i don't know is it wrong i don't know there what is right yeah. in this situation cuz that's like one of the goals yeah that's tough i mean that's super interesting i guess that's just like that's a lot of room to go and think about that and like break it down in your own head with every example that you might be a part of that's really cool um so on all of that, right? And obviously I want to be I want to be conscientious of your time and the boys and I want to I want to make sure I'm I'm not taking up too much of it. And I appreciate you coming by the way. This has been a lot of fun. Yeah. Um but a couple more questions. So obviously with what what with what you're doing now, right? What would you say your planned like legacy is? Like what's your north star with what you do right now and then what do you want it to leave when you're done doing what you're doing? Ultimately, I think and, and I kind of mentioned this earlier, for me, the legacy is that that the things I did connected human beings in a meaningful way. Not n- not like, look at all the, the exits that the brands that I helped influence had. Mm-hmm. That's cool. But the legacy of it is like that they had no idea maybe that we even had any influence. I hope that there are people at companies that have, you know, even when I meet people and no one's going to know I met with them. The goal is, can that leader go into their job the next day with the, a lens that helps them connect in a, in, a, in a more meaningful way. So I don't know how you make a book about that, but that's the hope is that, yeah, I love that. you know, people were connected and, and felt understood. So um, in the work we do today, it, this literally is like every, every retreat, everything that we're talking about is like, it's never been a t-shirt. Mm-hmm. But I even think now, like I started MFG eight years ago. And when I started it, it was, it was literally like, well, we've got this design and strategy thing down. What we don't know how to do is control the outcome of the products that are required of those experiences. Yep. And that's kind of the way we look at it. It's like the t-shirt is a part of an experience. And in itself, can it be an experience? Mm-hmm. If, I can, if I can create experiences that help you feel and, and believe the things that I want you to feel and believe, then your behavior will change. Mm-hmm. Right. That's the selecting into the culture. You're going to be like, I'm in. Yep. So, yep. So, you know, you get manufacturing and then we have a fulfillment group now. But to me, the, those are just the ecosystems to deploy experiences that connect human beings. Brand becomes the wrapper, right? Mm-hmm. The container, I guess. Yep. Um, but that's everything we're trying to do is say, can we help build brands that, that did it right? my last question for you and then I'll I'll let you enjoy your day and and get out of here. Um, And the goal of people that we bring on here is to go and try and and identify like, okay, how are certain people living like today's day, whether they realize it or not. 
what does that mean to you or where where does that intrinsically come from where you live like that without even realizing it or have you realized it and if you have why have you done it that way um that's my last question for you that's a big question i I hope that most of what i've answered or most of the comment conversation today has felt like one of those things is just to be intentional yeah to actually not just surface level but like weekly daily like at worst case semi-annually deep dives on why you exist, like, mm-hmm. like literally, and making sure, like, Seaball's got this where he's like, and then once you've defined that, how, are you spending energy, time, and money? If, if you're not giving it emotional effort, like, you can't say it's a value, right? Yep. So that's, what I will say is like, my youth was, we would argue, adolescence. Like, I don't know if I was crazier than anybody else, but like, it was adolescence. At 21, I get in a car accident. Um, and I would tell you that if there was a time that I should have been gone, like the next day I arrive on scenes just outside of Lake Powell and rocks everywhere, one sand dune and then a cliff. I, I crashed it right before dusk. So I, I had no idea. My dad and I drive the next day to the accident and he's, he starts weeping. He's like, how are you alive? And, and it was in the, like that, that 24 hour period where there was like a very, for the first real, real time, where I was like, I'm on borrowed time. Like, yeah. this is the, day. like, that's it. Like, and I, with everything I'd experienced, I don't think it ever felt like it was me. Like, someone else could go. Yeah. But I still got tomorrow, you yeah. know? And so, so that was probably, that's the moment. Um, and for me, since then, it's just been, you know, one of those things is, to try every single day. Sometimes I keep looking down at the spot over here. Sometimes for me, it's like the way the corner of the rug in the room and the shadow of, of the light sit. I look at that and I'm like, I just try to appreciate it. It'll be like the way someone's wearing their shoes. I'm like, I'm just grateful I see that. So it's a matter of gratitude and just trying to look for the things that make it worth it. Yeah. And and the last one I'd say too, which is, is maybe a, a slight off from there, it's just like, I got advice from a guy um, in San Francisco that I've loved. It's just like, be scared every day. I remember being like, what? He's like, not scared so you're like locked up in a room, but scared enough to know that what you're engaging in matters. Mm. He's like, you've got to, he's like, if you're just getting to a place of comfort, you'll, the today will be just like any other day. Yep. But if it's like, I've set it up where it matters, I think, you know, that that's the the amount of angst that I feel which makes, you know, even when you go to sleep, like, I think I need to stay up and keep going. Yeah. Right? Like, it's the it's the thing that kind of keeps the engine moving. I love that. I think that, that's a perfect answer. And again, dude, yeah, thank you. I think, I think that's gold. I think this will be an episode where people can go and re-listen to it and pick up different things that you've said. Because as I'm thinking back to our conversation, there's other things that I've been like, oh, that made a lot of sense. You're, you're brilliant, dude. I, and I appreciate you being out here. So Corey, thank you so much, man. Yeah. I really appreciate your time. Big time. Yeah. Thank you to the boys in the studio. And then obviously thank you everybody who, who tuned in till next time. Much love, baby. Thank you guys so much for tuning in today. Um, as always, it was a blast for me. I hope you got something out of this. If you got something out of this video of value, share this with a friend and please go show your love. We're on all streaming platforms, including YouTube, Spotify, and Apple. Any ratings, comments, likes, shares, they go a very long way and they make it so I can keep doing these things for you and I would appreciate it greatly. So please go share with a friend. 